Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming. I'm Man Biatan from the British Columbia Lung Association, and tonight we have our experts here to answer some of your questions or air, um, air quality concerns. So what we're going to do is introduce them and have them talk, and we limit the talk to be a very short one to give you a chance to ask your questions, if any, at the end of their presentation. So. Just raise your hands and we will give you the microphone to talk. And, and also, I would like to acknowledge the presence of our mayor here, Jeanette um, Towson. Welcome. And uh, so, let me begin. Dr. Brower is an associate, or is, is a professor at the School of Population at the U University of British Columbia, and his expertise is on air quality. Next will be Dr. Sarah Henderson, is an assistant professor and is working as a senior environmental epidemiologist at BC Centers for Disease Control. And of course, we have your very own Gail Rose from the BC Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy, and she's your air quality meteorologist. Okay, so Mike. So thanks, um, and as Matt said, so I'm uh, Mike Brower, I'm a professor um, at UBC. So what we're going to do is give you first a little bit of an introduction, some sort of basics on air quality and its impacts on health, what we know, uh, and then progressively move a little bit more specific into information about this region, this community. Um, so moving from myself to Sarah uh, to Gail. And then really most of the evening is for you to ask questions and have discussions. We will do our best. Um, to try and provide answers to what we can, and we'll come back to you later uh, if you know we can't answer the questions. We'll certainly do um, the work that we can to try and answer your questions. So really, um, urge you to just whenever we're talking, um, let those questions pop in your head and save them up and ask them. That's really the purpose of the evening. So um, to start, um, just kind of air quality and health. What do we know about it? And one thing first to keep in mind is that um, air quality really for any one individual, it's not the major impact, major driver of your health. There are many other things that are important. I don't want to give you the impression that when there's poor air quality, um, everybody is going to be dropping dead in the streets. That's not the case. Um, but having said that, it, um, it's important because we're all exposed to it. So you can contrast that with something like smoking. So smoking is much more dangerous for a person who smokes. I think that's obvious to people. Um, but fortunately, only 20% or so of the population smokes. But air pollution, when it's bad, 100% of the people are affected. And that's really what makes it important. The good thing about that is that if you clean up the air, everybody benefits. So it's like a free pass. Everybody gets the benefits if you, if you clean up the air. Um, the diseases that are affected by air pollution are the common diseases that are our most important killers. There's no specific air pollution disease. Air pollution um, causes heart disease, it causes heart attacks, it causes strokes, it causes bronchitis, it causes emphysema, which are our common killers. So it's a contributor. We call it something that is a, a risk factor, just like physical activity, smoking, alcohol abuse, drug abuse are contributors to poor, air, to poor health. Air quality is another one of those things. What, again, what makes it different is that this isn't a choice you make in your lifestyle, which is something we choose our diets. We choose whether we're going to exercise or not. Air quality, we, we don't have a choice. So whatever it is in our community, we, we breathe it. And again, that's sort of the responsibility that we share um, to keep our communities healthy. Um, what do we know? So we've been studying air quality in BC and actually throughout the world for probably 30 or 40 years and we know a lot about it. So um, we know from studies now that have been done all over the world that on days with worse air quality, uh, if we measure up data over many, many numbers of years, over many numbers of people, we know that on days with worse air quality more people will die. 
Um, we have to do this, again, statistically. There's, not, there's no test you can go to your physician and say, do I have air quality disease? Can you, you know, look at my throat? Can you look at my eyes and tell me that I have air quality disease? So we have to sort of aggregate up numbers statistically. But when we do that, it's very, very clear that when air quality is worse, more people will die. We also know that if you live in a more polluted city um, compared to living in a cleaner city, uh, you will live a shorter life. Um, all else being equal. So if we adjust for diet, physical activity, alcohol, smoking, again, all those things, if you live in a more polluted city, you won't live as long as somebody who lives in, in a cleaner city. And we even know now that if you live in, in the, a more polluted area of a city, a more polluted neighborhood, um, you will die earlier than somebody who lives in a cleaner, um, a cleaner neighborhood. Um, I'm talking a lot about death. Um, but that's just sort of the tip of the iceberg. So air, air pollution seem to have, seems to have lots of impacts on health. And, and the more we study this, the more that we understand. So the, the clear things are sort of obvious to you that it's going to affect your lungs. But I, I just mentioned earlier that air pollution can cause heart attacks. So what happens is your body is actually responding to this air pollution as a foreign object, like it's a bacterial infection and tries to fight it, tries to kill it and can't kill it because it's not something living. And your body is, is continually trying to fight this and has this heightened state of inflammation uh, in your lungs that then spills over into your bloodstream. And then you basically your body starts attacking itself, including your other organs, like your heart, like your kidneys. And we're starting to even see effects on the brain when we study it. So seeing suggestions that air pollution can cause things like depression, anxiety, um, even cognitive decline, so um, things like Alzheimer's disease, for example. So the, the effects are wide-ranging um, and are not limited to what is obvious, which is uh, affecting your breathing. We're also seeing quite strong evidence showing that air pollution affects um, pregnancy, leading to lower birth weight babies or premature births, um, development of diseases in, in children as well as in, in older adults. Of course, air pollution has many, many sources, um, some of which may or, or may not be present um, in this community. Um, what we breathe is that mixture. Um, so it's, so it's, it's challenging to say that the, the air quality in one community is only from one source or, or another source, but we do have, have techniques to try and give a good sense of what are the major factors um, that are contributing to that. And Sarah and Gail will actually talk a little bit uh, more about that. The main pollutant that we're really concerned about from a health perspective uh, is what we call particulate matter. So these are very, very small particles in the air. They're, they're not visible uh, to the human eye. We're, we're talking especially about particles that we call PM 2.5. So these are particles that are less than two and a half millionths of a meter in diameter. Uh, just to put that in perspective, you can see here this is a that long thing is a human hair, and that's about 100 um, micrometers or millions of a meter in diameter. Um, and these are the particles that we're talking about here. In fact, these very, very small red ones are the ones that we're most concerned with. So we can't see them. There's millions of them in the air. We breathe in millions of them every day, and some of them will deposit in our lungs and then lead to this in inflammatory reaction. So. BC has very, very clean air. Uh, and again, I, to put this in perspective, um, this is a map of air pollution around the world. So we're here and we're actually one of the cleanest parts of the world. That's great. Um, we, wanna, we wanna maintain that clean air quality and we wanna in fact improve it. Why do we wanna improve it? Well, what we're, what we're finding is that when we do um, studies that even though we have very clean air, it still has a very strong impact on our health. And this is just showing you um, um, risk factors for death in Canada. Um, so for example, um, dietary risks are the main killer in Canada. Um, tobacco causes about 50 or 60,000 deaths per year uh, in Canada. So those are the top two, high blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. Way down here, although not all the way down, is something like is air pollution. And we, we um, estimate that about 7,000 deaths per year in Canada are caused um, by air pollution. 
just on a, a crude estimate for BC is it's around 1,000, so 900 to 1,000 deaths in BC. So is that big, is that, is that, um, is that small? Well, it's the, the 11th leading risk factor for death in Canada, um, more than um, some of the other things that we, that we may sort of take, um, appreciate as, as big impacts. So even in, the, the message here is that even in a very clean environment like Canada, air pollution still uh, is important. It has large impacts on our health. And the reason for that is that when we do studies across the whole country, um, we really can't find a safe level. So um, we cannot find a level at which there's no measurement of, of health impacts. So these are studies now we're doing in about two and a half million people um, across Canada, and we basically see that the risk of dying, so this is what's shown here, the risk of dying, the level of air pollution, that risk goes almost all the way down to the, the background level of air pollution. So the, the bottom line for sort of the policy and our management approach is that every bit we do to clean up the air, we get a health benefit. And in fact, it's more than that, it's actually very cost effective. So if you think about the cost of health care, um, the cost that you would be willing to pay to improve your life or to extend your life, air pollution is very cost effective. The estimates are that for every dollar you spend on cleaning up the air, you'll get between four to thirty dollars back in uh, reduced health care costs and, and impact. So again, it's a good thing to do and it's, it's also cost effective and the reason is that everybody benefits um, if, you, if you make that change. Um, we're finding out, now this, this is from Metro Vancouver, so this isn't specific um, to Valemount, but even in a city like Metro Vancouver, or an area like Metro Vancouver, residential wood burning is the largest source. Why is that? Well, partly it's because we've been really effective in cleaning up our other sources. So if you think about a car today, um, it's about 98% cleaner than a car in the 1970s or 80s. Um, so you think about the fuel that we're using, the sophistication of the engine, we've done a lot in terms of proving technology. The same thing is true <coughs> for many of our industrial sources. Um, and uh, heating, for example, for gas or, or, or for oil. But what you can see here is that there's been very little change in the um, emissions of residential wood burning. Again, this is in Metro Vancouver, whereas, for example, industrial sources have cleaned up, um, motor vehicles have cleaned up a lot. So now, relatively, residential wood burning is the largest source, even, even in uh, uh, a city. Um, like Vancouver, which I think is quite remarkable because we actually don't burn much wood for heating. Mostly it's just fireplaces for sort of ambiance. So what do we know about the health effects specifically of burning wood? Um, and again, these are studies that we've done in Metro Vancouver. Um, what we do um, is actually we drive around in the middle of the night in the winter um, with a vehicle and we make measurements um, about every 30 meters. And so anybody want to join me and drive around at 2 in the morning in Metro Vancouver, just raise your hand. Uh, be, uh, it's, it's kind of boring after a while. Um, but we do that, and then we can link that with, um, with measures of health. So we actually know, based on people's contact with the healthcare system, um, who's having more infections, et cetera. Um, and when we do that, we find, for example, that areas and times of the year when there's more wood smoke, um, uh, there's a 15% increase in babies born at low birth weight uh, in those areas and times of the year, a 30% increase in middle ear infections. Those of you who have small children or, or have had small children, you know those ear infections are really severe, they're really painful, it's often very disruptive for the family, P uh, parents may have to miss work. Um, it's also the main cause of kids needing um, antibiotic prescriptions. Um, there's an 8% increase in hospitalization for bronchiolitis. That's a respiratory infection. So it's the number one reason that young kids get hospitalized. Um, and a 15% increase in hospitalization for COPD, which is chronic lung disease, um, which is, again, one of our major killers in, in Canada. So these are studies that we've done specifically showing impacts of wood smoke. And this is a very recent study done in <coughs> in four different communities, three, four, 
three communities across BC um, that Health Canada did in, uh, in partnership with us. And we found that on cold days and days with the highest uh, concentration of wood burning, there was a 20% increased risk of, of uh, having a heart attack. And there also seems to be a combination of fact that uh, cold temperatures and wood smoke work together. So on the coldest days, um, for every sort of inc small increase in air pollution, we would see about a 6% increase in, in, have, in the risk of having a heart attack um, in these BC communities. So um, showing pretty dramatic effects. And just to sort of flip this around, I would say if I could tell you today that there was a drug that would decrease the risk of a heart attack in your community by 20%, that would be huge. In fact, I'd be rich um, if I could do that, if I could find that, that drug to do that. So these are really big impacts. Um, so what, can we, what do we also know about when we, when we put in regulations or we, or we, we try and manage um, wood burning? So this is an example from California. Um, they had a regulation that they put in a number of years ago, um, and that would be um, uh, when there was a property transfer, so when you sold a home, you, ha you could not leave in an uncertified wood burning stove. Um, so it had to be either a certified wood burning stove or a pellet stove. Um, they banned the use of fireplaces and they had uh, specific days during the year when you could not burn at all. And there was no sale of used heaters. So that was their regulation. And then they looked at health before and afterwards. So first of all, the level of pollution dropped by um, 12%. And for older adults, it prevented 7% um, um, of cardiovascular disease and, and about 15% of, of um, primarily heart attack admissions to hospitals. So again, this law um, led to these health benefits. And you can sort of see that knowing how costly health care is, um, there's a big benefit and again, a, a sort of a, a financial benefit um, to the state for, for um, passing this regulation. Um, this is a little bit complicated, but the, the message here is if you move from a, a very unsophisticated source, so an open, open fireplace today is nothing like, an, it's the same thing as an open fireplace was 5,000 years ago, right? There's really no different. You're just putting in a pile of wood in a fireplace and burning it to something that's rather sophisticated like a pellet stove or a pellet boiler um, that we have today. And the main message here is if you look at the amount of pollution, starting at a fireplace, getting into more sophisticated technology like a pellet stove, um, the amount of pollution goes down. And the types of particles um, also change. So you get less, these are sort of blacks um, uh, or brownish sticky particles. These are black soot particles. And these are essentially particles that are, that are, are salt. Um, which are less hazardous. So as you get into more sophisticated technology, the type of particle released uh, changes and they're less toxic. So when we do studies of that, we find that they're less toxic. So again, moving to more advanced technology, you get less smoke and it's less toxic is the bottom line. Um, so we do have new regulations in BC um, that just came into effect this year and last year. Um, and that's basically the, the only purchases of new stoves, so the only stoves and um, appliances that you're able to sell in BC have to now be certified and they're, they're quite low burning. There's a setback for outdoor wood boilers and a phase out of older wood boilers. So again, the, old, the wood boilers that you can burn now have to meet certification. And there's uh, prohibitions on burning um, garbage, plastics, and treated wood in, in any um, wood burning appliance. Um, so we're hoping that with the, um, the issuing of these new regulations, we're going to start to see improvements. But one of the challenges is all the old appliances, um, all the old wood burning stoves that still exist in many residences. And that's where we have to think about other ways to sort of incentivize or, or think about getting turnover, just like we do with vehicles. So many people will take their vehicle, and when it's, it's um, ready to get traded in or sold, what you buy is a vehicle that's much cleaner burning. And that's really the process that we probably want to go through for um, wood burning appliances. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah, um, who's going to show you some data, I guess, right? Yeah, data. <laughs> 
So thanks again to everybody for being here and joining us this evening and for being interested in what we have to say. I also want to uh, give a special shout out to Andrew who, who lent us his laptop for this because none of our laptops would connect to this projector. Um, so we wouldn't be able to show the, you these slides without him. So thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, as men, pardon? <laughs> no, no, I like that one. <laughs> Um, as Men said earlier, I'm the Senior Environmental Health Scientist at the BC Centre for Disease Control, which makes it my responsibility to really understand air pollution across the province and to understand its health impacts across the province. All of my research is focused on the province of British Columbia. A couple of years ago, before Valmont got its PM2.5 monitoring station, the Ministry asked my team at the BC CDC to put together some methods that could help us understand understand which communities were being most impacted by residential wood smoke across the province. And we developed an algorithm that looks at things like temperature, variability in the day of PM 2.5 concentrations, and, and then we use that to estimate the number of smoky days in each community. So these are the communities that we looked at here. And this is the uh, way in which we ranked them. So they are, they are in order like this. And, and I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what you're seeing here. So each of these boxes, here we have the time of day starting at midnight and going to midnight. And across here we have the months of the year starting in the summer. These are the winter months here. So this would be December and January and then ending in the summer again. When we're looking at residential wood smoke, what we generally expect to see is in the morning when people get up, they turn on their wood stoves, we see a bit of a burst of wood smoke and then people go out during the day. Also the atmosphere rises up so a lot of the smoke can be kind of vented out of the area. They come home again in the evening, start the or restoke the fire. It burns through the night and the atmosphere comes back down again. So we typically expect the concentrations to be highest in the morning and through the night and then to uh, to be lower during the daytime hours. So if we're seeing a smoky community, what we expect is to see an hourglass shaped figure here with a dark area here and a dark area here. High concentrations in the morning through the winter, getting higher and higher as we get into the colder months and high concentrations in the evening with this lower concentration period during the day. So, as I said, these were our rankings of the communities for which we had available data. Houston was number one, Courtney Comox number two, Port Alberni, Vanderhoof, Whistler, Castlegar. And then as we go through the communities, you see that pattern start to fall apart. You don't see that hourglass figure anymore. When you get down to Kamloops, which was our least smoky community, that hourglass figure is totally gone. We'll take a look at the data for Valmont. We haven't done it yet, but I'm gonna guess that Valmont would be up in this row if we were to go through this exercise again, that residential wood smoke would be an important source in this community. Just to give you an idea of what it means to be a smoky community, this is the estimated number of days all year throughout the whole year over two years that were impacted by wood smoke. So in Houston, 45% of days in Houston are smoky. That's summer and winter. That's not 45% of winter days, it's 45% of all days. In Courtney, 30% of all days. So if a community is impacted by wood smoke, it tends to be quite impacted. When you get down to Kamloops, you're looking at more like one to 2% of all days. But in these really smoky communities, it's a pretty big impact. We took three of those communities and did some more of this mobile monitoring that was Mike was talking about earlier. So the communities that we decided to work in were Courtney Comox because we'd done previous work there before and we wanted to have some comparison data. We also looked at Vanderhoof and Fraser Lake um, because they had 
we're just kind of getting interested in putting together a air quality roundtable and starting to tackle this problem in their community. And then we also looked at Whistler, uh, particularly because Whistler was unexpectedly smoky in our data. Nobody, nobody expected quite that much smoke, and we wanted to look at that in a little bit more detail. So this is the smoke mobile, and indeed, I think this is the same smoke mobile we were driving 10 years ago. It hasn't changed very much. Um, and, and this is our high-tech equipment in the back seat and, and duct tape to the roof. And basically, this vehicle gets driven around at a relatively slow rate, as, you know, as slow as is safe, to, and on the same route, night after night, to try to detect those patterns in where there is and is not smoke. So these are the Courtney Comox routes, and I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds here in terms of the methodology for how we develop these maps. What you really need to know is that the darker areas are smokier and that the lighter areas are less smoky. The dots down here show the smokiness at the location of the community monitor. So on the Courtney side, uh, you can see we've got smoke all through the downtown area here. This is a smaller community called Cumberland off to the side. It's quite smoky as well. On the Comox side, we had sort of fundamentally different monitoring conditions for the nights that the Comox route got driven. So here you can see the, the community monitor is in this dark brown square, where here the same community monitor is in that more orange square. But even so, you can still see these spatial patterns. Quite a lot of smoke around here, quite a lot of smoke around here, quite a lot of smoke through the downtown core here. So what this allows us to do is really show within a region where that smoke is. And, and you heard from Mike earlier, we know that people who live in more polluted cities uh, are, have die sooner than people who live in less polluted cities and, and have more air pollution health related problems. And within a city, we know that that's true in the more and less polluted areas of the city as well. This is Vanderhoof, Fort Fraser and Fraser Lake. The same kind of information here, the same kind of patterns there. You see quite a lot of variability. It's estimated PM 2.5 concentrations ranging from 3.7 micrograms per meter cubed, which is pretty much background, up to 139 or 140 micrograms per meter cubed. So quite a lot of smoke in those places. And Whistler Pemberton. Concentrations aren't quite so high here, up to about 40 micrograms per meter cubed, but still you can see some very smoky places. Um, my particular area of expertise is actually forest fire smoke, and it was quite smoky here this summer, I know. It was quite smoky everywhere throughout the province, but you definitely had some smoky days. And I just want to show you a little bit of the types of information we generate at the BCCDC. Uh, one of my roles is, is what we call surveillance, which is really just on a daily basis keeping my finger on the pulse of what's going on across the pro province with respect to respiratory health. So what you're seeing here on the top is the number of physician visits build for asthma. So when you go to the doctor, the doctor is going to bill MSP for that visit, and when the doctor bills MSP, he or she is going to put down a reason for your visit. These are visits where the, that reason was specifically for asthma. What we've got down here is a few different indicators of how much forest fire smoke there was around. So you can see we have one smoky period here, one smoky period here, and it got even more smoky out here. And every time that happens, we get these peaks in people going to the doctor for asthma. Here we have, you know, a doubling or a tripling of what we would consider to be normal. So smoke has that really immediate impact on the respiratory health of the population. 
we like to try to give the medical health officers in a region some idea of what might be coming down the pipeline for them with respect to the health of their communities. So rather than just looking retrospectively at what has happened, we try to estimate what's going to happen over the next couple of days. So here, this is a forecast of what smoke is going to look like today on August 13th, if we travel back in time to August 13th. This here is August 13th, this red bar. So it was a smoky day, people were affected. And here's, on the same day, the estimate we're making for August 14th. So something in the model is telling us that it's going to get less smoky. Probably the wind's gonna pick up and start venting some of the smoke out of the valleys and out of the province. And then we provide this forecast to our MHOs. And what it's saying is we expect about 67% more asthma-related health visits than you would see on a normal day. On the next day, 115% more. So we're just, that's the kind of numbers that we're generally looking at when we see these somewhat smoky periods due to forest fire smoke. We wouldn't expect anything particularly different due to residential wood smoke. So I think that's all that Mike and I have for you. We're gonna hand it over to Gail at this point, and then we will take questions and hopefully have some great conversation. Okay, so yeah, with Ministry of Environment, I'm the air quality meteorologist. Uh, here we go. Uh, so I work out of the Prince George office, and a lot of people think, what, what does an air quality meteorologist do? I know what a meteorologist is, they do the weather. Um, what we do, and to put it in perspective for Vail Mount, is we do uh, airshed management, so come out and do these types types of talks, public reporting, do annual reports and that type of thing for all that sort of more public related outreach stewardship work that we do. Uh, there's seven of meteorologists in the province and we're each assigned a region. And so I'm out of the Prince George office, but this is the region of all the communities that I would work with. And that includes Vail Mount there at the bottom. Um, and another aspect of the work that we do is if there is industry and any kind of technical review required to air pollution that needs to be evaluated, they would bring one of the meteorologists in to do those evaluations. And that type of work, we can be assigned to any project across the entire province. Uh, so the presentation is a uh, pretty simple storyline. I'll show you, we do mo do some air quality monitoring here in Vail Mount. I'll show you where that happens, uh, what we actually measure, how it's measured, and then we'll go through the data story and look at the data and give you a local picture of what we're seeing for air quality, specifically in the community in terms of measurements. And then at the end, we can start discussing next steps or suggestions of, you know, what do we do now kind of thing. Okay, so a map of the town, community hall here at the bottom. The air quality monitors are on the roof of the fire hall. That's where the air pollutants are measured. And then we also have a meteorological tower that gives us all the weather data, wind, speed, wind direction, temperature, that kind of thing. That's on the roof of the courthouse. Uh, so that's a picture of the fire hall there, and these three white boxes are the air pollutant monitors. That's what they look, from, look like from the outside. Um, and what we do monitor there is the same picture Mike showed is particulate matter. So we measure two sizes of particulate matter at the site. Um, the focus really is where they see the strongest health associations is with that fine fraction, so those uh, red dots, as Mike explained. Um, we also do monitor PM10, and what that is is the, the blue dots on the hair, and so that's a bit more coarse fraction. Still has some health effects, but not as tightly associated as with the PM2.5. Um, I will bring this up again in the talk and it, for one of the slides, but one thing to remember is uh, when we talk about PM2.5, it's 
it's that big, or the pink, and everything else smaller. It's not just that diet, not just 2.5, it's 2.5 and all, everything smaller. PM10 is from 10 micrometers in diameter and everything smaller. So PM10 includes PM2.5. Okay. Um, and so the way to differentiate the two in very generally, PM2.5 for the most part comes from things that are generated in combustion. Vehicles, any kind of burning, uh, industrial facilities when you're uh, creating that combustion process. Whereas PM10 is more predominantly um, dust, pollen, uh, winter road traction material, sand being broken down on the road, sort of mechanical breakdown. That would be uh, PM10. And then there are particles even bigger in size than that, but they don't tend to stay in the atmosphere that long and they're not respirable. So uh, some examples here, this is slash piles, residential wood burning. Um, it's harder to see on the screen there. These are actually, these two photos were from Vale Mount. That's just dust being kicked up in an unpaved parking lot and then sand off the reservoir. That was one of the um, blow events that happened. Uh, Maybe just an interesting picture. This is, this is taken with an electron scanning microscope. It's essentially a very high magnification of some of these particles. And what's um, already probably pretty clear to you that comes from many different sources, particles look different, different sizes, different shapes, and that's just a few blown up photos for interest. Uh, so how we collect data, there's kind of two methods that we do. Uh, one is a continuous monitor, and so continuous monitors collect data all the time. And they're constantly reading, doing very short-term measurements, and the way, the way they're designed technically is to report out an hour average. When that hour average is collected, it gets sent to a database in the ministry. All the sites across the province come in, data comes in every hour. Um, that data is saved for us to evaluate reports and various evaluations, but it is also pushed out to the web pretty quickly. Um, so anyone can go to the web, get a pretty good snapshot of what's happening right now in my community. Um, usually within, you can expect within one to three hours of the current time would be a normal time frame uh, that you would see on the web. Uh, that's just a few snapshots of our current website. Uh, this is Vale Mount at some point that I took the snapshot over October 19th, so looking pretty low at that time, but it just gives you a few ideas. If you go there, you can get an overview of colors of the province for various pollutants. You can bring up graphs, current concentrations. <clears throat> and then the second method, which we all also collect in Vale Mount, is um, non-continuous monitoring. So. What that is, uh, in, the, in the case of Vale Mount, is there's these filters that are run every six days. For the day that they run, they run from midnight to midnight, so you get a 24-hour sample. Um, and it runs once every six days. That schedule is consistent throughout the entire country, so there's a more of a national picture they get um, with those. But they are manual, so it takes a person to go put the filter in, run the sample, get the filter out, send it to the lab, and then it eventually gets loaded into our databases. So that's, we don't get that information until probably six weeks after the data collection. But there is a diff different purposes for running these different samples. And I think this is the last one on the monitoring history. The, earliest monitoring the ministry did was started in 1997 and that was the, the filter based or the non-continuous for PM10 and PM2.5 non-continuous started 2004 and then uh, in 2013 I think it was uh, PM10 continuous monitoring started Based on what we were seeing and the signatures and the data, it made more sense to change that monitor to a PM 2.5 continuous monitor, and that's what's currently operating now. So right now there's a PM 2.5 continuous, and both of these non-continuous are operating, along with the uh, meteorological tower 
since 2008. Okay, so we'll get into some data. Um, first off, we'll look at particulate matter and compare it to provincial objectives. Pro provincial objectives really simply are a benchmark that are used to evaluate in terms of airshed management. It gives you a mark of, you know, where are we sitting at? Should we make, be making some efforts to really drive these numbers down? As you heard um, Mike and Sarah say, there, there really is a continuous relationship with health effects at all levels. But when we talk about airshed management, we do have things and we do live. So these benchmarks provide us an idea. Are we like way too high or should we really be focusing to drive those numbers down? Then we'll look at the data <clears throat> in terms of um, what the trends look like in different seasons and um, during each day and that will help to sort of demonstrate what it helps to identify sources to some degree. <clears throat> So this is the continuous PM 2.5 monitor. And what we're looking at is a calendar, starting in January, going through all the way to December. This is for last year of 2016. I'm showing this because it's currently the only full year of data we have. Monitoring started at the end of 2015 for uh, PM 2.5. The colors are in relation to where the provincial objective is for PM 2.5 for the day, like we have different types of objectives and we have one that if you look at one day and you take all the average, you take the average of all the day, of the hours in a day, and if it's over 25 micrograms per meter cubed, you're exceeding the daily objective for that day. So the blue is, we're below the objective, that's zero to 15. Yellow means we're still below the objective, but we're approaching the objective. Red means you're at the objective or above it. <clears throat> and so also looking at the one year period, what's key here is you can see January, February, October, November, December. That's where most of the red and yellow is and not as much in the summer. There are some yellow days there and that um, certainly can indicate other types of activities, but right away when you see that very strong winter signature in a town like Vail Mount, it, it certainly, in my mind, I'm thinking, yep, wood smoke. <laughs> um, so if you count all the red dots uh, for 2016 last year, um, 39 and I'll show you some annual averages, but I will tell you now that's, that's high. Um, and then there was one event, so, you know, when we're, we're sort of teasing through data, there are sort of regular activities happen in a town, and it helps to characterize, okay, residential wood burning, sure, but I am aware that, you know, I'm sure the whole town's aware of it, and it was quite a contentious issue. There was a burn event that happened last December that ended up in very, very high concentrations that would be equivalent to being in the middle of a forest fire with very heavy smoke conditions. That, um, and those are the sort of the daily averages we saw during that burn period, and that was in early December. So that's some of what that red blotch is. So that's um, quite extreme to see, and... Um, I know also the village has certainly made changes to bylaws and such, but those are the types of things when we talk about air quality management where the ministry certainly can provide support of like how can we look at this in more detail and what, what can we do. Um, but that certainly would contribute a lot also to annual averages and that. It was a, quite a shocking event for me to see actually. So this is... Um, the graph that I just had up is this middle row. So this is just showing you all the data that we have for PM 2.5 to date. Uh, the reason why I wanted to look at that is just to look at the patterns. And again, you're seeing, even though we don't have full years, we're seeing a lot of red and yellow. It's being consistent year to year so far that your heaviest years are certainly in the winter, with the exception of this summer. <laughs> That's wildfires, 
Um, and then, I don't know if I had anything else on this slide, but um, so it's just giving you the perspective of when we're looking at the data, we're trying to tease out what's, a, what's the regular occurrence of pollutant sources and like are there individual events that have happened and it's important to understand those so that when we talk about air quality management that we're um, focusing on the right things. Um, that's just a picture of, I guess I could go back. Oh, actually, I think it'll disappear here. So this is a satellite image from this summer, July 11th. Um, these red dots are all the forest fires. And Vail Mount's up here. It might be hard to see in the screen, but you can just see how all the smoke has gone through all the valleys, and that's where you see all the red dots in the summer. So this would be one of the red dot days, and that's a visual for you. So looking at um, PM 2.5, um, each block is a season. So spring, summer, fall, and winter. The purple line is the PM 2.5 concentration. And along this bottom line, so we're looking at concentration going up here for the purple lines. And this is the time of day going from midnight, one in the morning, noon is in the middle, so this is the daytime and then going back into the evening. And I, there's a lot you can say about this graph, but I think the important things to look at are, you can see in the summer, we've got relatively lower purple lines, so lower concentrations. The lines are also thinner, so they're consistently low. That can mean two things. Um, when you talk about air quality, it likely means you have less pollutants being put into the air, but also in terms of meteorology, you get much better dispersion in those warm weather months, right? So you've got less sources, better dispersion, consistently low pollution. The complete opposite is the winter. Poorer dispersion, more pollutants, lots of variability and big high purple lines. Um, also, uh, when Sarah had mentioned when she was speaking about those, um, we call them sorry, a diurnal or a daily trend, you can definitely see a wood smoke signature in this winter. Uh, winter graph here is you'd expect to sort of see this smooth line going down and back up, but you can see seven, six, seven, eight o'clock in the morning, people getting up firing up a wood stove. Um, four, five o'clock people coming home from work, putting stove, wood stove in. 11, 10, 11 o'clock at night, going to bed, putting more, firing up for the evening. So just purely from a data perspective, any, wouldn't matter what town it was, if I see that kind of activity, it's pretty clear and repeatable signature that you see with residential wood burning in communities. Um, and this is essentially that same message, but what we're looking at are actually hourly concentrations. So every hour over, this was um, February, early February of this year. And I just chose this just for a demonstration. This, each color is a day. So in, you can see where the big dot drops in the concentrations are during the daylight hours. We're getting better dispersion and less burning happening at the same time. But you can really see those activities in that shorter hourly periods when people, when you can actually see the concentrations really bouncing around when we're looking at hourly concentrations. And in addition, this one's a good one for meteorology too. People are doing the same thing every day here. It's not people putting more wood in necessarily, but what we have here is probably a high pressure system. So um, that's the meteorology coming in and the atmosphere during those systems are, is actually being compressed and it's kind of being squished down. And when you're in a valley, it will hold it in there. And so you're having the same activity happening, but it'll build over time. So some of that's just the weather contributing to that um, climbing trend as well. Oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, so for 2016, we look at how much PM 2.5 came from each season, over 50% during the winter, 24% in the fall, 15 in the spring, and 8 in the summer, sort of how it divvies out. Um, 
this is, <clears throat> this helps us to see, is there anything, any source coming dominantly from one direction? So how you would interpret this is, you're, if you're here, you're sitting on the courthouse roof. And if you look uh, to the northwest on the roof, um, when, the winds, when the winds are really calm and we don't have a lot of wind movement around, you see the high color, that means you're seeing high concentrations. So during calm conditions is when we see the highest concentrations. And then, uh, for example, here to the, more to the south, you can see a little bit of yellow and somewhat elevated concentrations as you look out. So if you're sitting on the courthouse roof and you're looking to the southwest and winds are four meters per second, so it's just a light wind, um, sort of a breeze, we do get some sources coming. So if I think about where that is in relative, that's still fairly residential. And so it just helps us. In some communities here, you don't see a super strong pattern, but in some communities you can almost pinpoint if it is a single source or something, you can see a very strong signature. Here, I would say that, you know, when you have those poor dispersion conditions, low wind conditions, when we're seeing the highest. Uh, this is taking all the measurements for the whole year and averaging them across many sites in the province. 4 p.m. 2.5. We also have an objective in the province for that, so if you're over 8 micrograms per meter cubed, um, that's exceeding our provincial objective. Um, this is not all, what it, there was too many sites to include, so you could read them, but there's a bunch of other sites and they sort of scale down. I've just sort of cut off the top of the graph. And unfortunately, as you can see here, Last year, Vail Mount's right at the top. Um, not only is it at the top, um, when we talk about annual average, if you get up in the nine range, you don't want to be there. And so when you're seeing a big step jump like that, that's, that's quite significant to be at 13. And um, yeah, and so when Sarah in her talk how they had done the analysis to look at the wood smoke patterns and they had recognized Houston as number one. According to last year, it was done on a different year, but Houston is very smoky according to the measurements as well. So, um, And then this also helps, this it helps explain partly why we went from a PM10, because you know, there are some dust sources here in the town. Why did you go from PM10 to PM2.5 monitoring? A, tighter association with health effects, but B, the data also, this is what suggests uh, why we should have done that. Um, and so these are the non-continuous monitors that had the filters. We had, at this community, we've got them both PM10 and PM2.5 take a sample at the same time every six days since 2004. And so what I did was I put the, you divide PM2.5 over PM10, and then I won't go into all the math and the reason why you do that, but essentially what, how you would interpret this is the higher this number, or the higher this ratio is, it means that Essentially, PM2.5 is over 70% of the PM10 sample, so it's really being dominated by PM2.5, again, in the winter months, right? It's sort of the same story over and over. We're looking at the data and everything's showing us the same thing. In the summer, sure, we're down to 50%. You would always expect to see some PM2.5, but this is really where we want to, if we have to focus on one thing, it's PM2.5 for sure, and that's why the monitor was switched over. Um, and, but we do have some PM10 data. I thought I'll, I won't spend a lot of time on it. Um, same calendar, this is all the calendar type data we've got. We did see some exceedances, but again, if you remember back to that graph, a lot of that is PM2.5. You're seeing even exceedances in the PM10 objectives, which are higher. Um, so that means we're seeing some pretty high numbers. Uh, so a lot of these in the winter months are probably PM2.5 dominated. And again, um, in 2014, there were some wildfires that affected the area as well. Um, that's just a satellite of 
one of the red days. <clears throat> um, I don't think I'll spend any time on that. Um, it is interesting, and I, I actually don't know the answer, but when with the PM10 monitor, there was, I did look at the dates of, oh, why are we seeing some elevated PM10 from the north uh, when it's windy? I'm not sure exactly. Um, it was sort of half during the winter time, so that could be, that's burning of some tar part, but there were some spring dates in there too. Could be road dust, it's, it's actually hard to really know. But. Um, so when we talk about things like residential wood burning, where and when that pollutant is released is really important. Um, when we work with industry and they have the big tall stacks and we have to do the modeling and deciding on all the parameters that they need, that's always designed to maximize the dispersion so that populations will be impacted to the minimum amount that we can reasonably get them to. Um, but when we have things like local wood burning or open burning that's happening in the community on the ground, that's being emitted in a very, it's very inefficient combustion. It's right where you're breathing. And even in particular for residential wood burning, it's happening when you're at home. So the exposure is a really high. You're taking in a lot of that pollutant because you're close to it. And then, of course, cumulative impacts. So um, everybody's doing it, so it all contributes to what everyone else is breathing in. So key messages, um, we are definitely seeing strong exceedances of daily and annual provincial objectives. Um, highest concentrations are in the winter. Major sources, <coughs> likely residential wood burning. It isn't clear to me yet how much, like when we came in today, we could see open burning up in the hills. You know, I don't have a strong sense of how often or how much that happens. That certainly could be a contributing factor. Um, PM10, yes, there are occasional dust events, but they're very short-lived and much less frequent than the PM2.5 signature. Um, and that's likely localized dust, as, which is a very common source in the northern communities that get snow, um, and also the, the reservoir. So when this is essentially a short slide that sums up some of what Mike was talking about, when we are looking at air pollution, it is public health, but it is also factors to the local economy. If there's a lot of pollution, it's difficult to bring in more industry to that, even if they do have air emission sources, you know, it's, it's just not a runaway train. You have to find that balance so that your air shed can stay healthy. Um, and also it's a deterrent for tourism. You know, it's not as attractive to bring people in so it's really about looking at all those pieces. And I know there's a lot I haven't mentioned that I do recognize there's a lot of challenges in this community, and we haven't talked about that yet. But really, it's about looking at those big pictures and trying to figure out how do we tweak things and get to that best uh, balance that we can. And have we really looked at things in detail and what, what's out there that we can look at? Um, and that's where you kind of get into this whole airshed management picture. Um, it's easy to sort of sit back and, you know, if someone's heard about one solution, oh, well, that won't work here or whatever. But really, it's, it's a slow process, and it needs to be a thorough process, and you want to bring in the right partners that can link you up with the right resources and also connecting those um, resources along with the local knowledge. And that's really what we see across the province works best. Um, if airshed management is locally driven, uh, certainly the ministry's there to provide a lot of support, provide connections, answer questions of like, how do we even do this? <laughs> and be a partner in airshed management. That is our role for sure. And we do it right across the province. Um, but we can't turn those wheels on the ground. Like if there's an event that's happening, we need that local drive to say, yes, we want to be involved in this. And with help or with support or guidance or information, we can really make decisions that are best for our community. Um, but what you need is a, 
multi-stakeholder. It really, air quality is always quite a contentious topic. Um, in a lot of communities, you, that, that is the fabric of community. People sit at different areas on the table. Some people might be at one end and other people have completely the opposite opinion. But the idea of having these types of round tables is it provides a venue for people to express their opinion, but also to listen to others and figure out where that balance is right for your community and bring in like what the ministry often provides in these types of situations is we support that planning process if people don't even know how to get started, how do we do this? We facilitate collaboration in any type of this data translation or providing connections to, there's a lot of airshed groups that have done really great work out there providing examples of different initiatives, examples and bylaws that people have done, like there's a whole scope of things in airship management that can be considered. And it's about finding that time to really carefully um, go through all those different steps. And then, of course, um, where the other partners come in, there's a variety of different community partners that would have interest or may have interest in airshed planning and I have seen, like in the case of Smithers, they had a really fantastic output in terms of some educational opportunities or someone there that is fantastic at doing graphics and they did a really great campaign and educational initiatives that caught the eye and the ears of the population and that was just a local talent that he was more than happy to step in and help. So those um, different partner synergies, maybe someone that's not even related to air quality, once you get talking about trying to find those potential solutions and where to land. It's interesting what comes out of the woodwork sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, so these are, I just put up some logos of some um, essentially air quality round tables. These are multi-stakeholders. Uh, there's a variety of pathways that happen for these uh, round tables to form, but I would say, looking at the ones up there, um, the majority of them were really concerned citizens that went to either industry or municipal and uh, provincial government saying we want to do something here and then the, it sort of got the ball rolling. Um, again, I've sort of covered a lot of that. The purpose of them really provided, you, it provides an avenue to have collaborative, meaningful, objective discussions. Um, they provide more transparency as well. In cities like Prince George, lots of heavy industry and there's always, um, there can be, it's, getting, it's gotten a lot better over the years as PGR has been working, but there was a lot of mistrust between uh, public and industry and you know it still does exist to some point. Um, but the work that PGR done has done a lot. It's done a lot to advance the knowledge and understanding of air quality management in that community. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I can talk more about it, but um, I guess in general, I'm sure people may have more questions, but in general what roundtables do is often they're sort of, they play a really pivotal role in that public education and awareness activities. Um, and, or if there's incentive programs, so for example here you could have a wood stove exchange program where there's funding available um, from the province annually, you, someone needs to apply for it but locally someone would need to run that program. Um, some groups probably not needed as much here, but they do their own monitoring. Um, if there was a certain aspect of concern, sometimes these round tables will do a really great job in reviewing literature or examples that have been done elsewhere in the province. And in the case, if the province is a recipient or a municipal government's recipient, the round table can say, hey, we've written up this document and we'd like you had a, we have some suggestions and sometimes that provides enough information to actually make change so it's it just provides avenues for all those types of activities to happen I think that was it